my name is Kylie Barber. I'm the National PKU um, Alliance Medical Foods Policy Fellow in partnership with the Every Life Foundation. And we would like to welcome everybody to our web webinar this evening. Um, first, we'll hear from Christine Brown, who's the Executive Director of the National PKU Alliance. And then following Christine, we will hear from Sarah Chamberlain, who is the Founder um, and Director of PKU News. And then we will go from there. Um, okay, I'd like to turn the time, time over to Christine. Thank you so much, uh, Kylie. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here tonight with you all um, and to be here with Sarah Chamberlain, uh -huh. the Executive Director of National yeah. PKU News. Um, so just a reminder, as you come on the phone or the computer, if you could please meet your, mute yourselves um, to help with background noise. And um, we'll have a chance for for questions um, at the end of the, the webinar tonight. Um, so before I turn it over to Sarah, I just wanna give you a brief overview of tonight and what's gonna happen. So as Kylie stated, she's the NPKUA's Medical Foods Policy Fellow. She is normally located in Washington, DC, walking the hills of Congress for us and the PKU community um, every day, except for right now, she's still safe at home in Arizona and doing all of her work virtually. Um, so what's gonna happen is um, after I turn it over to Sarah, Sarah is going to give you some general um, grassroots advocacy strategies. Um, and she's gonna talk a little bit about that piece um, after Kylie gives you more information about where the Medical Nutrition Equity Act is and what the status is. And then you're gonna have the opportunity to hear from some amazing advocates. I'm really excited to have Heidi Maxfield with us. She is a powerhouse out in Utah. Um, and our other powerhouse couple tonight is Jackie and Shane Osterman from Iowa. And you'll get to hear their story as well and some advice from them. Um, after that, Kylie is going to talk to you about how you can get involved and a lot of different opportunities that we have starting um, actually, I think, later this week or early next week throughout the course of the summer. Um, and so it's going to be hopefully an action-packed webinar tonight. And again, I just thank you so much for uh, spending your evening with us and learning more about what you can do um, to help us advocate for medical foods coverage and also ensure that the PKU voice is heard at the national level. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah quickly. Hi, forgot to unmute myself first. Um, I, just wanna, <laughs> I just wanna echo Christine's uh, welcome to everyone. I'm so glad to see so many people uh, took the time and have the time, we all have a lot of time on our hands right now, to um, to join us tonight. And I think, um, you know, it's just a tough time for many reasons um, that we're all aware of. And um, sometimes when you're feeling a little helpless, you can feel hopeless and we don't know when the situation is gonna end. And I hope that tonight, um, you know, we can give you some strategies and help you plan out some ways that you can really take action um, and help yourself and give yourself a little bit of hope for, for what we're doing on the Medical Nutrition Equity Act and also just advancing the, the agenda of the PKU community in general. So um, I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but just I'm glad to have everyone here tonight and uh, I look forward to working with you all. Take it away, Kylie. Okay, thanks, um, Sarah and Katrina. So the first part of our webinar will be um, covering a year review of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, as well as highlighting the advocacy efforts over the last year. We've had a pretty incredible year um, with the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, and we're excited to share with you. Um, perfect, thank you, Katrina, for that next slide. Okay, so I first wanna talk about the coalition that the National PKU Alliance, as well as PKU News is involved in, that is driving the Medical Nutrition Equity Act effort. So the Patients and Providers for Medical Nutrition Equity Coalition represents patients and family members who manage disorders that require medical nutrition products to sustain their lives. The coalition has about 40 members and works to educate 
federal lawmakers about the critical importance of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. The coalition developed a cost analysis that was actually just released this past January in 2020 on the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, and this cost analysis will be used by the Congressional Budget Office to guide their own official score. Um, a CBO score is very important for lawmakers to be able to assess how much a bill is going to cost. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of our lawmakers um, like to see that data before they want to support a bill. So this is a very um, huge milestone for us. So we're very excited about being able to have this cost analysis data. Um, and then also in May, a year ago, May 2019, the coalition held a Capitol Hill Day with more than 250 Hill meetings, or yeah, 250 Hill meetings um, attended by 100 advocates representing more than 30 disorders who all advocated for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. So this was a huge Hill Day and we were very excited about it. We saw um, many fruits from our labors that day, and it was a really good way to kick off the reintroduction of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act as it had just been reintroduced about a week prior to our Hill Day, so it was great timing. Okay, perfect. And then next we will talk about Rare Across America, and for those of you who don't know or haven't heard what Rare Across America is, it's a program organized by the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates, RDLA for short. Many of you may know um, that, that organization by RDLA, a little more familiar. Um, and so RDLA provides advocates the opportunity to meet with their members of Congress close to home in district during the August congressional recess. Last year, we had a total of 47 PKU advocates sign up to meet with their senators and representatives during the month of August. Um, some highlights from Rare Across America in 2019 include Medical Nutrition Equity Act advocate Anne from Massachusetts, who had the opportunity to meet with Representative Jen McGovern, who is the lead sponsor of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act on the health side. She was able to thank him for his work on this important issue, and she also had the opportunity to take a picture with him and post it on Facebook and um, thank him for his time during the meeting. And you can see Anne and uh, Jim McGovern on the very left picture on the screen. Um, let's see. And then one PKU dad from Nevada, Derek, had a particularly impactful meeting with health staffer of Representative Cortez Masto of Nevada and was actually invited to speak about PKU and the Medical Nutrition Equity Act at a local round table. Uh, additionally, our PKU advocate, Jason, he's done, um, he's been really involved and done a lot of great work for us over the last couple of years, met with Representative John Molinar and actually secured his commitment to co-sponsor the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, which is a great example of exactly what we wanna see from advocates. So thank you very much, Jason. All right. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So in December of 2019, um, another excellent advocate for PKU, Kristen Vonig, testified on PKU and the urgent need for medical nutrition legislation during the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus Briefing on the economic burden of rare diseases, which was coordinated by RDLA. Chris Ivonix is a co-founder and former president of Georgia PKU Connect and is a leading advocate for medical foods coverage. She also serves on the Georgia Newborn Screening Advisory Committee and the National PKU Alliance Affiliate Council. Kristen is a trusted expert on medical nutrition legislation and has led advocacy initiatives at the state and federal level for over 10 years. So she is an expert advocate. To view her testimony <laughs> at the caucus briefing, you can find the live stream at rareadvocates.org slash rare caucus, um, which is the link that you will see towards the bottom of the slide. And for all those who are wondering, we will send all the links that we feature in our presentation um, in a follow-up email. So um, if you write them down, great. If not, don't worry about it because they will be in the follow-up email after this, uh, after our webinar. Um, next slide, please. All right. 
So last but not least was Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill 2020. On February 25th through the 28th of this year, 900 rare disease advocates traveled from across the country to participate in Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Rare disease advocates participated in 393 meetings with members of Congress to carry the message that every voice matters. And this was a particularly um, important message, especially for those of us who are in the rare disease community. Um, we often feel but siloed because once again, we are a rare disease. And so every voice matters um, was our main message and was something that really we wanted to carry through um, to members of Congress. Of the 900 rare disease advocates, 40 were PKU advocates who attended 113 meetings on Capitol Hill to advocate for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. During Rare Disease Week's legislative conference, MPK, MPKUA, as well as PKU News held a breakout session, especially for advocates interested in advocating for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. And we ended up having over 50 Rare Disease Week advocates attending the session. So that included all of the PKU advocates, as well as some other um, conditions who require medical foods as treatment. And since Rare Disease Week, the Medical Nutrition Equity Act has gained six new co-sponsors. So once again, um, we always see the fruits of our labors from our advocates' work, um, you know, by garnering more legislative support um, by way of getting more, more co-sponsors. So we're really excited about that. Okay. And now I will turn the time back over to Sarah Chamberlain to go over grassroots advocacy strategies. Great, thank you, Kylie. Um, so I am going to try to go quickly, but I wanna give a brief overbill, overview of the bill for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, so that when, you know, when you're out there talking about it, sending emails and trying to advocate for it, you have a better understanding of it. So um, I'm just gonna talk about how a bill becomes a law and the current status of our bill. And then a brief overview on what's important in telling your story. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to the three people who have really uh, have great stories to tell tonight. Um, and I wanna save as much time as possible for them. Uh, next slide. So first, uh, you heard Kylie talk about Kristen Vonnegs, and I wanna thank her for this slide, which I stole from a presentation she and I recently did, um, as well as all her wonderful advocacy. Um, this is just a brief history of medical nutrition bills. Uh, the NPKUA in particular has been working on a medical nutrition bill of some sort for over a decade. Uh, it is a long haul, um, but we are closer than we've ever been, so I think there's good reason for hope. So as you can see, the first Medical Foods Equity Act was introduced in 2009, and then you see successive bills in later Congresses. That just means they didn't get passed. Um, in 2017, the Medical Nutrition Equity Act was introduced. Uh, the current bill is the same text as this bill with just a couple minor clarifications. So this is our bill that we're working on right now. Um, Starting in 2017, it was bipartisan, bicameral, and identical, which means people from both parties were lead co-sponsors. Uh, it was introduced in both the House and the Senate, both chambers of Congress, and the text was identical in both chambers of Congress. And that's just important because if it's not identical and the House passes it, and then the Senate, Senate passes a slightly different bill, they have to reconcile and it makes the process that much longer. One thing to note was that in 2017, the language, oops, go back, <laughs> the language um, from the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, our current bill, was included in the National Defense Reauthorization Act that, as you might imagine, reauthorizes the military budget for the coming year. Um, and that military budget governs TRICARE, the insurance for military personnel. And so those who have TRICARE currently have the medical nutrition coverage that we're trying to fight for for everyone in the United States. And that's just something to keep in mind if you are talking to um, a congressperson or a senator who has a tie to the military, you can remind them that this bill has already passed for the military. Um, the 
bill did not pass in the 115th Congress, and we moved on to the current Congress, where it was introduced in the House, um, as Kylie said, in May of 2019, and introduced in the Senate just last week. So you can go to the next slide. Um, yes. So quick overview of the bill. What conditions does it cover? It covers all conditions on the recommended uniform screening panel, what we call newborn screening, um, as well as other specific conditions, some GI conditions, protein allergy, allergy conditions, Crohn's and colitis. Um, those other conditions, Kylie talked about the patients and providers for medical nutrition equity. Those other conditions are, are included in that coalition. So we are all working together. This is not just a PKU bill and it's not just an inborn errors and metabolism bill, but there is a huge community behind this bill, which I think also should give us some hope because it's not just our small numbers who are fighting for it. Um, what products does it cover? For our community, it covers metabolic formula and low protein modified foods. It does not cover gluten free foods. It does not cover other low protein foods you'd find at the grocery store, cassava chips, et cetera. That's another thing you'll run into. People say, well, you know, if we start covering food, you're gonna want us to cover gluten-free pasta. And we say, no, we're not. These are foods that are specifically manufactured to be low protein modified foods. Um, and then the big question is what, how much does it cover? Um, and this is language right from the bill, but the important part is 80% of either the actual charge or the determined fee schedule, which just means what the insurance company agrees with the manufacturer is the cost of the product. So it's an 80% coverage with a 20% copay. Um, one thing I didn't put on this slide, which is a question that always comes up is, if my state already has really great coverage, is this bill gonna make it worse? And the answer is no. If you get $1,000 a month from the state of Texas, or you have coverage, unlimited formula, 100% coverage in California or Massachusetts, your coverage will not change. This is what's known as a federal floor bill, which just means it brings everyone up to a certain minimum level, but it doesn't bring anyone down if their state-based coverage is better. Uh, next slide. Um, these are our Schoolhouse Rock friends in the corner. Uh, they have a little MNEA bill or button this time, but um, this is just a quick review of how a bill becomes a law. We have the original co-sponsors who introduced the bill to Congress. Next slide. And in our case, those co-sponsors are James McGovern and Jamie Herrera Butler in the House and in the Senate, uh, Robert Casey and Joni Ernst. Then you have co-sponsors. Those are other legislators who agree to support the bill. You can go to the next slide. This is where the momentum comes in. There's no magic number of co-sponsors we need to get, but um, the more, the better. Uh, right now, we don't have any in the Senate because uh, we have the two original sponsors, um, but the bill's only been in there a few days. So the next, the next sort of task is to increase the number of co-sponsors in the House and add on Senate co-sponsors. Committees, I'm not gonna go into too deeply, but um, you can go to the next slide and it'll show what committees um, the bill is under. Often we need to um, talk to the staff or the, the representatives on those committees to make our case. Um, and then after we get a certain amount of co-sponsors and the bill moves out of committee, which means the committees have voted on it, approved it, and brought it to a floor vote, um, then the full House or Senate, probably not together, maybe even months apart, will vote on the bill. And what happens if the bill doesn't get voted on in the current Congress? Congress congressional sessions are two years, so we're almost through this, the second year of this Congress. If it doesn't happen and the bill doesn't get passed and signed into law, we start over. And as much as that sounds like discouraging, it's not because as you know, Kylie said, we've come further with this bill than we have with any of the others. Um, 
and we really have a lot of momentum. And what happens when we quote unquote start over is we go back to all those people who were co-sponsors in the in the current Congress and say, we need you in the next Congress. And almost all of them are gonna say, okay, because we've already made our case and they're gonna move forward in supporting the bill. Um, next slide, I can't remember if I have one. Yes, telling your story. Uh, in the Schoolhouse Rock, it says laws are made by the folks back home, and that's you. Your representatives in Congress work for you, but they need to hear from you, from as many of you as possible. It doesn't have to be people who are affected with PKU. It can be your friends, your family, you know, your coworkers, anyone who is a, is a resident of that congressional district or that state can contact their legislators and ask them to support the bill. Um, you can also pester your legislators. Uh, I think Heidi will we'll talk a little bit about that, about how important it is to follow up and, and Shane and Jackie as well. I mean, you can send them emails every couple weeks, every week. Uh, make sure it's not the same email, it's not a form email, but if your situation has changed, a lot of us are experiencing job loss or job insecurity in the pandemic. If that's a reality for you, sending an email that says, hey, I might lose my medical nutrition coverage because of this situation, um, you know, we'd really like you to take a look at that. That's a really important angle that will that is sort of new information to them and will help them you know, take another look at the bill, hopefully. Um, so just, just keep following up, keep you know, reinforcing how the bill will affect your life. Uh, they need to know what, what you need, which is that you need them to co-sponsor the bill, and they need to remember you. So give them details about how uh, having medical nutrition would affect you or your family. Uh, ways to tell your story, you can write a letter or send an email, which is obviously easier than writing a letter, but you know, Postal Service needs help too. So um, you can create a video. Um, if you are creating a video or even you know, just sending a tweet or using Instagram. Um, there's a certain value in social media because it's public. Uh, other people see you asking your representatives for assistance and those representatives in Congress know that your requests are public. And that makes, that gives it a little more <laughs> pressure to respond, which is important. Um, Kylie again mentioned the Patients and Providers for Medical Nutrition Equity. And Christine also said, we're doing a day of action next week with them. And I think Kylie's gonna talk more about that. But that website also has a way for you to share your story. Uh, you can upload a photo, talk about what medical nutrition coverage means to you, put in how much it costs you per year, what state you live in, what kind of medical insurance you have, a lot of that information we use when talking to Congress, and we even print out those stories. I mean, when, when Kylie goes to the Hill or when the, the lead lobbyist for the coalition goes to the Hill, she prints out the stories from the state, um, you know, for the, for the state whose representative she's visiting and sort of lays them on the desk and says, these are the people, these are the individuals, the humans whose lives are being affected. And that really makes a difference uh, rather than just saying, you know, here, here's Bill 2501, we need you to sign on. It's here's the stories of the people this bill will help. Um, so if you have a chance or if you haven't yet um, submitted your story on nutrition equity, and also you can follow nutrition equity on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and if you tweet, you can use the hashtag medical nutrition equity now, which is the coalition hashtag, but obviously applies to what all of us want. And I think with that, I'm passing it to Heidi. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay, okay great. Um, first of all, thank you um, for having me. I'm honored to be among, I know many of you, and I am so grateful that all of you are here because it means that you care about PKU and about making life better for people like my son who is 12 and has PKU. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk about um, local media outreach, and you can go to the next slide. There we go, right there. Um, I'm just going to talk about making connections, 
talking about your story, and I know Sarah covered a little bit about that. Um, if I can just add, all of my members of Congress from the state of Utah know who I am. I send every single one of them a Christmas card and make a specific effort to keep in touch with them by email, by phone. Um, <laughs> Um, Congressman John Curtis even has my cell phone number and we text and he knows that I am never going to give up until he signs on to this uh, medical research and equity bill. Um, next slide. Thanks. Um, the first thing is making connections. So I happened to play on a tennis team with a Salt Lake City newscaster. So that was kind of my initial connection. And when I go on to talk about this, I don't want you to think that you have to have a big connection like that in order to make local advocacy possible for you. Um, there are lots of different ways and I'll give some suggestions, but I actually had known this friend for a really long time and we were close, but I had never approached her about talking about PKU on the news. And I had another teammate who encouraged me and said, why don't you just ask her, see if she'll do it. And um, so I did. And she actually jumped on it. And she was so great and so helpful. And um, if you don't know somebody in the news, I would suggest next thing to do is ask family and friends, see if anybody else has a connection. Maybe somebody writes for the local paper or uh, a magazine or they're a blogger online. Uh, there's lots of ways to find media connections. If you don't have any, uh, go to the next slide. I would encourage you to start by writing your own story. And this link is gonna be available afterwards so you can see one of the stories that I've written. But I wrote a story for the newborn screening department um, in the state of Utah's health department about my son Owen and his diagnosis. and. That was one of the stories that I have written over the years. And it was a chance for me to compile journal entries and things that had happened that were unique to our family um, and to share them. So if you're taking notes, a few suggestions, you can contact your department of health. You can contact your clinic. You can contact the medical schools. I've had a chance to speak to many medical schools in states that we've lived in to share our PKU story with future doctors, which I think has made an important impact because those doctors are going to diagnose babies that have metabolic disorders. And my experience was that our doctor at the beginning didn't know enough about it. So that's something that I really wanted to improve. You can contact your local support groups. You can contact um, if your kids do summer camps that have to do with metabolic disorders, uh, you can contact them. and. Find somewhere that connects with your story, connect with those people and find out how you can share information. Next slide. So the next thing I would encourage you to do is regular sharing on social media and also interacting on social media. I actually don't share a lot of public social media information about me and my family, but I do share about PKU regularly. And the reason I do this is because the more awareness we create, the more attention we get, the more funding we're able to secure, which leads to research, which leads to better bills being um, signed on in Congress. And so that's important to me. I think I've listed a few things on this slide that are good times to share on social media. Obviously you'll see stuff during the month of May for PKU Awareness Month uh, also December 3rd, which is PKU Awareness Day. Uh, other ways that you can share are the daily struggle, uh, things that have happened to you and your family every day. Maybe you ran out of formula and your insurance wouldn't cover it so you didn't have enough. Or maybe you couldn't afford low protein food that month. There's lots of different ways that we can acknowledge PKU every single day. You know, like, oh, I didn't have time to weigh my food today, so I got too much. Or there's, there's so many ways. And Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, there are lots of different platforms you can do. I just put a picture here of PKU Awareness Day last year. I had um, my son's siblings all dress in PKU and they wear their PKU wristband. And um, it's just a way for us to remind people that PKU is still here and it's still something that we need support for. 
Next slide. Actually, you know what? You can go to the next slide, but I, I, want, I do want to add um, on that last part that it's helpful to follow PKU groups on Facebook and Instagram as well. I think what Sarah was mentioning is the more followers you get, the more likes you get, as silly as it is, that's the way to get attention from um, people who can make a difference, whether it's in Congress or for funding. They want to know that there are people who care about these issues. So to identify some media outlets where you live, I think that there's lots of different ways to do that, but you can look at news stations, local channels. Um, we even, in our advocacy efforts last year, contacted the Today Show, Good Morning America, um, your local radio stations. Like I said, the social media platforms are important. Um, old fashioned newspapers are still around and magazines. Um, internet, you can write opinion editorials. Um, one quick tip for those things is every one of those things, when you contact them with your story, wants to hear something short and sweet. So keep it short, no more than a page if you're emailing or writing something. And uh, next slide, please. So last year, uh, in December, PKU Awareness Day, we did a big media blitz. And um, there's a picture right in the middle of me and my friend, Amy Oliver, who I know many of you know well. Um, we kind of pushed for all of our news pieces to come out on that day. So we did a morning show radio interview. Um, and just one quick note for that, they have one of the stations here in Salt Lake City is 97.1 ZHT. And I actually am not a radio listener, but I thought on my way to the interview, I better study up about, about what, what happens on this news station. And I just happened to hear them say, it's Passive Aggressive Tuesday. Make sure you tell us your passive aggressive comments. And at the end of my radio interview, which was probably about 10 minutes long, they asked me, what is your passive aggressive that you wanna share with Salt Lake City today? And I said, oh, I sure wish Senator Mitt Romney would call me back because I'd called him hundreds of times and he wouldn't get back with me. So that was kind of just a funny side note, but study up, be prepared, make sure that you know who you're contacting, um, whether it's radio, whether it's TV. Amy and I also did a um, noontime news interview, which was kind of like a highlight to get people interested in the 10 p.m. special report. And if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to play that and you can watch it. It's a three and a half minute video that was done by um, our local KUTV channel two, um, which is CBS here in Salt Lake City. And I'll let you guys watch that. And then I'll just conclude with a few things to remember. It's PKU Awareness Day. PKU is a rare genetic disorder that doesn't allow the body to process proteins. As Shauna Lake learned, there are certain kinds of foods that PKU kids need just to stay alive, and no one is helping to provide it. 12-year-old Owen Maxfield is thriving, a good student, passionate about basketball. It's a life his mom Heidi has fought hard for. She wasn't sure what his life would look like when she learned he was born with a rare genetic disorder called PKU. They tell us that there's this chance that our perfect little baby could not live to the potential that we had in uh, mind for him. PKU is a metabolic disorder where the body can't process protein. When phenylalanine builds up in the blood, it causes neurological damage. To make sure Owen reaches his full potential, he has to eat an incredibly strict diet. A lapse in that diet can cause brain damage. So his formula is $78 a can, and he goes through about a can every day and a half or so. To get his nutrients, Owen depends on special expensive foods, including this formula. Some insurance companies cover part of it. Some insurance companies do not because they consider it a food. And um, for us, I mean, this is the kind of food that he has to have to live. I see these other kids who don't have the same opportunities and it is so heartbreaking because you see their potential and because of silly laws, um, and 
insurance companies who refuse to cover these things, these people are lost to care. Those who are lost to care don't have access to this diet and don't get the proper nutrition. And because of that, suffer behavior problems, seizures, and severe intellectual and developmental disabilities. So why don't I make your formula? That's why Heidi and moms like her are fighting for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, which would make it a law to provide coverage of medically necessary food and vitamins. Several lawmakers have heard Heidi's plight. Congressman Chris Stewart and Rob Bishop have signed on, and Representative Ben McAdams is co-sponsoring the bill. McAdams told me he was touched when he met Owen and another young girl, both struggling with PKU. Why did you feel like this was important? It seems like it should be covered, but the fact that it's not, I think, is, is troubling. And so that's what this legislation is intended to fix. In Utah, it is required by law that medical food is covered by insurance. So you're saying in Utah it is covered? State law requires that they be covered. However, there are loopholes, lots of them. The Utah Insurance Department only regulates 28%. People who work for the federal government are not covered, and there's something else, something called a self-funded employer plan, which makes up roughly 70% of all insurance plans in our state. And that could be the employer's choice. So when they put these self-funded programs together, employers have input with their uh, insurance companies of what they want to cover. That's why Heidi says the only chance for her child is the Medical Equity Nutrition Act now and in the future. We were all sort of blessed with different gifts and talents, and um, one of mine might be that I just am never going to give up. I mean, he's worth it. Any, any life is worth it. Now, it seems so unfair. Hey, maybe you can help. Shauna tells us the Medical Nutrition Equity Act was introduced into Congress, but it still sits idle in the House Energy and Commerce Committee just waiting to be passed. As a parent, if this story touched you, get involved. We put a link on our website of how you can contact your congressional representative. Um, I just want to close up my remarks with a few things that you can remember. Um, the first one is, we've said it before, but write down your experiences and share them all the time. Um, PKU is a family affair, whether you have PKU, whether you have a child with PKU, or whether you are fighting for PKU for different reasons, like Kylie is one of our um, fellows that really fights hard for us. Highlight something interesting that is happening with food, with your formula, with insurance as a chance to share awareness with those around you locally and with those in your circle. Um, the last two things to remember to include when you're advocating for this cause is what is your ask? The first one, what is your point in sharing this story? Um, what, is, is it that you want people to support the Medical Nutrition Equity Act? Are you fundraising for a cause? How can the community rally behind you? And the next thing is to include emotion and struggle. Um, everybody that I talked to in various media outlets said that they want to know the reality. They want to know what has been hard. They want to know how you have grown. And they want you to include that. In fact, the cameraman, when he was interviewing our family, said, if you cry, it will for sure be on TV. And I <laughs> I didn't really want to, but you know what? I'm passionate about PKU, and so it isn't that hard um, because it's real. And the reality is that there are a lot of things that we need to improve and change. So I would just encourage all of you to start today if you haven't already. Um, write down your story. Find some way that you can connect that story with others and then share it. I would be happy to help you find your local contacts if you don't have any. So please reach out to me afterwards by email, um, and I'd be happy to help you in any way I can. That's it for me. Hello, can everybody see us? We didn't, we were bad. We didn't prepare slides, but we figured we'd get on camera and share a little bit with you guys. Everybody hear us okay? We can and see you. Thanks, Shane. Yes. So All right. Um, I am going to start off. We're both going to talk a little bit about um, just fostering relationships with our legislators. Um, I'm going to start off, and I hope that I don't do too much repeating of um, what Heidi just talked about, because um, she is totally, absolutely right in all of her points that she made. Um, and I am just going to reiterate a lot of those. Um, and then Shane's gonna 
talk a little bit about actually meeting with um, our legislators. Um, but I think just to start off, um, I think we all know that the very foundation of um, being PKU parents is that we are our kids' number one advocates. And um, the reality is though, so many people are willing to help us if they know how, if they know our story and um, know enough to be enabled to speak out for us too. Um, I would say before you can show up and meet with your senator or your representative, um, there's so many ways that you can prepare for those meetings. Um, the things that we have done uh, personally as our family um, is we have become very, very comfortable with sharing the ins and outs of PKU um, with our friends, with our family. Um, and uh, we basically, we could give you a two minute elevator speech if we had to um, and give you the rundown of what PKU is. Um, but we could also share a deeper story with you um, and let you know some of the personal struggles that we've also had. Um, one thing that, uh, some examples of what our family has done is every year for the past five or so years, we have, um, we have gone down to the University of Iowa and we have talked to about a lecture hall of about 200 first year medical students. Um, and we tell them our story from beginning, um, the initial diagnosis of those hard emotions and, and the reality of what we went through as a young family. Um, and maybe I should reiterate, both of our kids, uh, both Zay and Ellie have PKU. So we have two PKUers. Um, but we tell them right when Zay was born, um, all the way through uh, the political implications that we are dealing with in the present moment of having two kids with genetic disorders. Um, I also go down um, in the spring and I talk to a public health class um, about newborn screenings, but I tie PKU into that public screening or the newborn screenings as well. Um, I even talk to a local MOPS group. Um, I, we've been on our local news uh, stations. I think we've been on four separate times. We brought them into our school and they've watched, um, they've interviewed our school nurse who cooks our food for uh, our kids. They've watched our kids go through the lunch line on the news, um, as well as um, I've done a teal pumpkin project where I've been advocating for, um, you know, around Halloween time and I, I tie PKU into it. Um, uh, Shane also serves on um, the Congenital and Inherited Disorders, Disorders Advisory Council, that was a mouthful, um, here in the state of Iowa, and he also serves on the Iowa PKU Foundation. Um, basically, I'm saying any opportunity we're given to speak publicly about PKU, we jump on it. Um, and uh, I will tell you, uh, I am totally not comfortable right now. Uh, I'm not a public speaker at all. <laughs> But I know that if I can get in, if I can get on the news, if I can get in front of uh, medical students, like I feel like everyone can, because uh, if you, when you love your kids that much, you'll do it. Um, and I'll say, in addition to all of these in-person things that we've done, like Heidi was uh, saying, I'll reiterate that social media has been huge. Um, sometimes we feel like people know Zayanelli and us better than we actually know them, um, just because of social media. Um, but it definitely spreads the message. And um, with us being so open on social media, I would say that uh, that definitely helped us um, provide the army army that uh, we we use to convince uh, Senator Joni Ernst to sign on as the co-sponsor for this uh, Congress uh, for the MNEA. So I will hand it over to Shane and he can talk a little bit more about meeting with them. Yeah. So. Um if you can't tell a trend, all of this stuff works together. So you've heard, I think, everybody speak a little bit about um, being willing to share your presentation, or who you are and what's going on, being willing to share, um, you know, about your kids. And it's not just the, it's just not the, the good stuff you share. You're also sharing the heartache. And with us, we've been lucky enough um, in the state of Iowa to have some pretty receptive senators. Um, I think, uh, Senator Grassley, who was the lead co-sponsor, Republican co-sponsor in the Senate, um, I think that was the first time we had a Republican um, senator as a lead co-sponsor, and that was really harvested from um, actually our family. 
So through everything that we've been able to do, we have had to utilize kind of a bunch of other people involved. And it just so happened Jackie's dad had a relationship with Senator Grassley, which kind of kicked off some of the conversations that led to him ultimately um, being a lead co-sponsor. Um, more recently, this Congress, we've been actually working with Senator Ernst to learn more about um, about PKU and this bill since before she was a senator. I remember having a conversation with her when she was actually on the um, campaign trail uh, about this. Um, and again, she, um, Jackie's dad had a great relationship with her, which actually helped uh, help do that. But I think we've met with her over six times as a family or with her staff and in person twice um, we've met with her as well, which is not always the easiest thing to get, but we've been persistent in just continuing to ask it and share the stories. Um, we also have, as we fought insurance and done different things and tried to help other people get coverage, we've also included um, our our senators on some of those email chains. So they know what's going on. They know what's happening. Um, we, up until recently, we've been blessed basically the entire life for our kids. We've had food and formula covered until really the last couple months. Um, and so I, I would say that one of the most important things that we've been able to do is actually when we get in the meeting with um, any of the legislature or anybody who's serving in Congress, we actually, probably go about it a little bit differently, but we make sure that we're well-rounded. We know what we're talking about. We know kind of, you know, the ins and outs of PKU, uh, just like what the news story did, the little bit about the science, uh, a whole lot about the emotional toll. Um, the other thing that I always try to do is I actually will push hard on what I think the, um, what, what kind of hurdles they're gonna face. So when we met with Senator Ernst, I talked pretty quickly with her about the fact that, you know, the insurance lobby is probably going to stand against us. When we were out there in May um, in 2019, I think there was two weeks after after we were there, I, I'm pretty sure that the insurance lobby took most of the staffers out, out on a retreat for a weekend and, you know, all expense paid type thing. And we, we can't compete with that. And we shared that story with Senator Ernst of how challenging it is to know that our kids' health just doesn't really you know, matter in comparison to that. And if she wasn't willing to step up and, and stand against the insurance companies, then there'd be a problem with that. We we leveraged in that meeting talking about she um, used to be in the military and she actually, you know, supported and passed um, basically the same language in the, with TRICARE as what was mentioned before. The other thing that I think that we push pretty darn hard on is to ask her about what types of opposition she would have in supporting it. Um, and honestly, asking that question and staying silent might seem like that'd be an easy thing, but to kind of watch her kind of eyes look at me like, well, I don't really know. Um, and, you know, she kind of murmured and stammered around for a while um, and then went on to say that she's worried about the cost of the bill. But again, we were, I was kind of prepared for her to come and say that. And this was before that study had been done. And I just made it clear that, that the cost of not treating PKU is more expensive than what the cost of treating PKU is. Even if you get outside of the kind of the extreme cases where, you know, somebody's institutionalized, still the cost of not treating it is significantly more. Um, I think the funniest story that I kind of found that I had to kind of, kind of just walk away from is when, she started talking and uh, um, and actually Jackie's parents were there and Jackie er, and Jackie's dad asked, so is there any opposition in Congress? And when she told me that Chuck Schumer was, was going to block anything that she did, I really got a good chuckle out of that, but it was just kind of funny listening to her tell that story. But um, we, we, we uh, always try to make sure that we're pushing hard um, at dealing with any of the opposition that she would have. In some ways, if you ever take any type of a sales class, you have to get to those objections and be willing to deal with them and be and know enough about why it's important to, to push through those. Um, and so we've always done that by talking about the fact that our kids' health and their brain is just more important than, you know, if you're against regulation, that, that's, uh, that's fine, but how does that mean you're also against protecting my kids' brains? Um, and so we push pretty hard on that. And all of that situation, I think that 
all the times that we met with her and talked with her, I think set a foundation for us when we found out um, in February when we lost coverage. Uh, and that kind of gave us the impetus to kind of get going and gave her the background for um, us to be able to leverage that. And I'll let Jackie kind of speak a little bit about that. Um, so back in February, actually February 19th, um, I had shared a Facebook post on uh, social media as well as Instagram. Um, and I, it was a very simple post. It was a video of our kids uh, walking into uh, their appointments down at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. And um, it was just explaining that Wellmark, our insurance company, had um, had stopped, they had started denying our our coverage of medical foods after they had been covering it for 18 plus months. Um, and so just that reality of what our family was going through um, and me sharing that with our friends and our family and the, the whole entire internet, um, that one post was shared 149 times and reached uh, something like 10,000 people. Um, and more important than what, how many people it was reached was that it spurred, spurred people on to uh, take action. And we um, estimated that hundreds of people called Senator Ernst's office in support of our family or other PKU families that had shared our posts or just uh, friends and family that shared that post and, and encouraged Senator Ernst to um, support the MNEA and co-sponsor, be the lead co-sponsor on it. And that was the final push that we really felt like um, it took to get her to sign on. But I am so certain that without the whole foundation of us being willing to share our PKU journey um, and, and kind of putting ourselves out there repeatedly and having gone to meet with Joni Ernst's office repeatedly, um, all of that foundation, but when something uh, spurred all of our friends and families and strangers into action, um, it really just felt like that it was that final push that she needed that more people than just our family cared. So, um, yeah, I think that's... That's a story, I guess. I mean, if anybody has any questions or if there's time for any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Um, we're pretty easy to find on social media too. So. Um, if there's anything we can do to help, uh, we've done a lot of stuff with trying to fight insurance companies, both um, especially in the ERISA, ERISA area, but also just with state insurance. We're, we're getting better and better at learning the ins and outs of that. So anything that we can do to help, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Shane and Jackie. Um, at this point, we're going to turn it back over to Kylie, and she's going to give you some different examples of opportunities available starting early next week um, to help us in this fight, to help yourselves in this fight and your kids in this fight. Um, you know, I'm sure that you're inspired after hearing from Heidi and Shane and Jackie, and so we want to give you some ideas on what you can do to help. Great. Thank you, Christine. Um, I understand we have about three minutes left according to the original plan. So I will try and be thorough, but also um, move through this quickly so we can have a, a time for a couple questions. Um, once again, as I move through these events, don't worry about getting um, writing down all the details of the dates because, again, we will send a follow-up email with um, additional details. So for the first uh, upcoming grassroots advocacy opportunity. It's actually next week on Tuesday, May 9th, and it is, will be held by the Patients for Providers for Medical Nutrition Equity um, Coalition. And the coalition is asking that advocates set um, time aside that day to participate in the National Medical Nutrition Action Day by completing some easy action steps that you can do from your computer. Um, to participate, please sign up on the coalition's website via the link provided on the slide. And after you sign up, you will then receive a link to all of the action items. The coalition will be sending an email with instructions to all those who sign up on Monday, May 18th. 
These steps will include things like sharing your story and sending a simple e-letter to your members of Congress and a few more activities. Um, the action items won't take a lot of time, but by all joining together in one National Medical Nutrition Action Day, we really can make a significant um, impact towards our goal of getting the Medical Nutrition Equity Act passed into law. Okay, next slide. So then the next opportunity will be Rare on the Road. And once again, for those of you who are not familiar with what Rare on the Road is, it's a rare disease leadership series hosted by Global Genes as well as the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases that provides critical education and insight into the rare disease community. Um, usually this is done in person, but once again, dealing with the COVID-19, they have transitioned it into a virtual experience. Um, there will be two parts. The first one will be on Tuesday, June 23rd, and it will, will include participants engaging in interactive tutorials on how to tell their rare story and how to get involved in advocacy. This event is open to all rare disease community members and will feature special guest speakers, including a rare disease patient and a policy expert. And the second part will be held on Wednesday, June 24th, and this will consist of meeting with local rare disease community members with this unique video chat experience. Um, this session offers participants an opportunity to learn from local rare disease leaders, share ideas, and form lasting relationships with their peers. This session will focus on issues and resources specific to the states of California, Louisiana, Minnesota, and North Carolina, but residency in those states um, is not required and anybody can really register for, for this event. So for more information about Rare on the Road and to register, log on to everylifefoundation.org slash rare on the road. Okay, next slide. Great, thank you. So the last um, event that we'll talk about over the summer is Rare Across America. And I mentioned this earlier um, in the first part of our uh, webinar, but I'll go over sort of what it is again and how you can get involved. Um, basically, Rare Across America is an opportunity to meet with your members of Congress close to home. RDLA staff organizes meetings for rare disease advocates with their members of Congress and or the member staff. The meetings will take place in the member's district office during the month of August while Congress is in recess from August 3rd to September 7th, 2020. The RDLA team also helps to prepare advocates for their meetings, providing legislative resource materials and hosting pre-meeting training webinars. Um, no prior advocacy experience is necessary. Um, registration is now open and will stay open until July 3rd. And to register for Rare Across America 2020, um, you can log on to rareadvocates.org slash America. Okay, next slide. And for those of you who need to go, I understand that we are a couple minutes over the original scheduled time, um, but we feel that it's important to hear from you and answer any questions that you guys have. Um, so we'd like to turn the time over to anyone who has a question. I have one sort of random question about um, sharing on social media. I don't know who is still around to answer. Um, is there any, does anyone else get the feeling that the things they share on social media get liked and shared and posted around the same circles? Is there any particular strategy for um, really grabbing the attention of people who are outside of those circles? I know anything I post about PKU gets liked by the same five people. And I very much appreciate those people, but I feel like I'm not as successful as I could be if I were doing something different. Hi, Emma, this is Heidi. I'll just chime in really quickly. Um, I know it is hard because we are rare and we're small in number. Um, one thing that I would try out if you're looking to reach more people is to use 
hashtags that are really common if you're on Instagram or Facebook. And you can even go search those out, whether it's um, like when anytime Intermountain PKU posts something, we always hashtag Intermountain PKU so we can kind of reference it. We also type um, hashtag Cure PKU or we hashtag um, like phenylketonuria or just PKU. So I think if you go and search for those hashtags, you can find different groups of people who you want to connect with so that your um, following grows, I guess. And that would be one suggestion for me. I don't know if that's helpful. It's Katrina. I think another um, good thing to do also is when you're when you're posting something is to ask people to share. Um, it's an action that you can ask them to do and then follow up with a thank you. And um, just to make sure when somebody follows you to turn around and follow them because then they're more adept to share your post. Um, this is Shane and Jackie again, and we were just saying original content, not, not, uh, I would say personally, I have found the most success with being very, very personal with our family. Um, so that way our family and our friends, like they see Zay and Ellie and they care about Zay and Ellie and that spurs them on, um, to share and it just reaches more people when it's a very heartfelt, um, we have also, we have a local company that we have done a fundraiser with and they, uh, we did t-shirts, we did PKU t-shirts and um, we were blown away with how many of our friends and family uh, purchased t-shirts. And then um, this was a few years ago, they all, I asked them, we posted pictures of us in our t-shirts and we asked our friends and family um, if they would post a picture of themselves in, in the PKU t-shirt too. And, and I did that privately um just reaching out to them and um yeah it was it was pretty successful so maybe um if you don't want to ask publicly you could even send out you know to your 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 group of trusted friends like hey would you do me a favor and help spread awareness for us this is sarah chamberlain another idea is really i mean it depends uh, twitter is better for this because you can sort of at your legislators um, and really call their attention to it or more likely the 19 year old working in their office's attention. But um, that gets your story straight to the office of the representative or senator. Um, and also I think the same thing, sharing those hashtags, you know, if you, if you put in the hashtag about medical nutrition equity now, then the coalition is gonna see it and they are gonna be able to amplify that message. Um, and that's you know, 30 organizations all working on the same bill. So if they can see your voice, again, like Heidi said, because of the hashtags, uh, even if they're, you know, they don't know to follow you yet, um, once they know that you're working on that issue, um, it, gives them, it gives them an in to sort of amplify your message. But I think really directing it also right to the legislators is important. Those are all awesome. Thank you so much. Anybody else have any questions? I actually did. Uh, my name is Mia Scott. Um, I had a couple of questions. Number one, um, I know you had sort of touched on earlier the different types of disorders that um, NENA covers. And I was wondering if we could perhaps get a list um, just as far as reaching out to like local news media and that sort of thing, um, just as far as sort of indicating the enormity of it, that it's not just this small group of people that very likely it affects other people. So if there was something perhaps a little bit more common, if, if we could get a list to help sort of address that piece of that, would that be a possibility? Yes, great question. This is Sarah Chamberlain. Uh, if you go to nutritionequity.org, there is a list, I, th I think the link says, you know, conditions covered or something really obvious like that. Um, I'm gonna look it okay, up right now, cool. but um, that gives you the conditions. It also gives you the parameters of the bill, like I said, you know, what's covered. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that is, and you're right that, you know, this is a broad coalition. I mean, a lot of people have heard of Crohn's disease, you know, if exactly. that, there's, there's a huge population that's affected. Now, when you look at that, um, 
this is this is a little bit in the weeds, but the people who have Crohn's and colitis or colitis don't necessarily need lifelong treatment the way that people with PKU do. Um, so uh -huh. someone might say, oh my gosh, there's, you know, I'm, I'm going to pull a number out of a hat, you know, half a million people with Crohn's. Um, right. Is that bill going to cost a lot? And that's where you say, you know, no, because they only use it for a short time to deal with a flare. Um, the PKU uh -huh. community is very small, and really it's the inborn error community that uses the treatment lifelong. Uh -huh. uh, but right. that will give you a list, and you can direct people to that. There are fact sheets for each disorder on there. Um, it's just a good place, as well as the MPKUA website, to find um, resources on the bill. Okay, cool. Um, and then actually I had just a couple more quick questions. Um, number one, uh, for those of us that are um, on various current treatments that are available, uh, what approach do you recommend taking in that regard? Um, because obviously it's not necessarily that we're advocating for that particular medication. It's we, we're coming from a place as far as the medical nutrition is a, a prior experience that we've dealt with. Um, what do you have a suggestion on how to how to tell that story or what angle to come at that from? So this is Christine um, from the National PKU Alliance. You know, um, in PKU, you know, we're very lucky that, you know, we have some other treatments available that are FDA approved. But uh -huh. by and far, the first line of therapy for everyone um, remains medical foods. Um, you know, particularly, you know, for, for babies, and children, um, you know, into young adulthood um, before people can get on some of the other approved therapies that are out there. So I don't mm -hmm. know if that answers your question, but you know, by and large, the majority of the community, you know, still uses medical foods as their primary source of treatment. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of what I was trying to figure out. Just because, as I tell my story, I'm I'm currently on a medication that's working very very well for me, but I I'm pushing 40, um, so I'm pushing 40 years of having that battle and all those sorts of things. And I'm just wondering what, because I don't want the focus to be that here, I've got this solution, so I don't need this. So I'm just wondering, maybe if this is a better, like a one-on-one -on -one type thing of, of how to, maybe I could touch base with somebody in particular just to sort of run by, hey, do you think this is an okay angle kind of thing? You know, right. And the other thing, too, is even if you don't use medical foods anymore to treat your condition, you right. know firsthand how important it is for people to have Absolutely. access and to have mm -hmm. that as a choice. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. perfect. This is, this is Sarah Chamberlain. I was going to say the same thing. Basically, you don't have to reveal your current medical status. You can okay, talk cool. about how vital medical nutrition is to people and talk about when you were growing up and talk about when you were a teenager and talk, you know, you don't have to sort of say, I don't need this anymore. Um, right, right. So, and if you do have specific questions, I'm happy to, you know, have you bounce them off of me as well. Um, but I think, you know, just as Christine said, it's, it's the entire sort of community and you can talk about your experience without being specific about your current treatment. Cool. Okay. And then final question, and this may be something for follow up later, but um, I don't know who I would talk to. Um, I work for a, a large corporation that potentially could have a big voice that's really big into philanthropy. Um, and so I'm not sure if you could recommend who I would talk to amongst your team of folks and grassroots people, um, how to go about reaching out to their head. I, I know the people, but I'm just wondering about how how to sort of guide that conversation. So I don't know if you have a recommendation of who I can talk to to help get them involved. I think we can follow up with you after the call. Um, Perfect. We'll, we'll sort of sort that one out and, and we have your email and we can reach out to you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry to chatter. <laughs> no, great question. Don't worry. And apparently we answered everyone else's questions, so <laughs> Hey. <laughs> uh, hi, this is Kendall Temple. Um, I wanted to, so I kind of come from a very weird perspective. 
uh, with this. I was never actually covered um, by uh, formula or medical foods because they didn't have them. However, I did try uh, in 94 to go back on diet as an adult. And um, I live in the state of Maryland, and so I was never able to get on uh, back on diet. So that's where my struggle really was with the insurance um, issue. Um, more that when I finally agreed to go back on diet, um, it wasn't available. As far as the insurance wasn't, um, there, was, there was no way to pay for anything. So I never actually ended up going fully back on diet or any of the specialty foods. So I don't know how my story can play into advocacy. Maybe someone could uh, speak with me individually about how to carry that story into advocacy. I'm going to jump in. Kendall, this is Mia. I personally, knowing your story, I can think of a gazillion ways that you would be an amazing advocate. So even just touching base between us would be awesome too. But of course, I'm sure they've got great ideas. But definitely, I think your story would be fantastic for advocacy. So I just throw that out there. <laughs> yeah, and we can try to connect you as well with the advocates in Maryland. But um, you gave me your email address earlier, so I'll also reach out um, and we can toss some ideas back and forth. And I think the important thing to remember too is everybody's story is powerful and everybody's story is important. Um, and that's what people on the Hill want to hear. They want to hear stories and they want to hear it from real people and not pay professional lobbyists that makes total sense to me yeah okay that sounds good I'll throw get some things together I got some ideas well thank you so much for the 26 people that hung with us um, to the end um, you know I think it was some great discussion afterwards I would really like to thank again um, Heidi for joining and sharing her story. Um, thank Jackie and Shane as well um, for sharing their story of what they've done in Iowa. And of course, you know, a big thank you as well um, to Sarah Chamberlain and to Kylie um, as well. So, you know, we're all in this together and we just need everyone's help on the phone and not only your help, but your friends' help and your coworkers' help and your family's help, so we can continue to move forward and ensure that anybody who needs medical foods to treat these conditions has access and coverage. So thank you so much for joining us. Sarah, I don't know if you also have any last words you'd like to say before we close out the session. That covers it. I just want to say that Heidi is already tweeting about this webinar and tagging me. So <laughs> she's just really taking the lessons that she's teaching you all to heart. Um, and I was a little distracted because I had to go into Instagram and reply to her. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And uh, hopefully I'll be taking some action uh, next week. Again, sign up for the at nutritionequity.org to get the alerts for next Tuesday's action day. Um, and uh, I look forward to working with all of you as we go forward. Thanks.